Hey, I'm Pete Krause with Modern Cardboard, and this video is part one of a three-part playlist for PAX Premier 2nd Edition. In this video, we focus on how to play through this whole game multiplayer style, and if you're wondering, this is definitely the right place to start. Part two is where you take what you've learned in this video and learn how to play solo against the AI opponent included in this game called the Wakan. Part 3 is where you can watch actual gameplay and watch me stumble and make poor decisions against the Wakan. I'll post the playlist link down below in the description as soon as I release the other videos. So let's reduce the time it takes to learn this game and get started. By the way, stick around to the end of this video and I give you my top 5 misunderstandings or things I didn't realize from my games. So in Pax Pamir, you get to take the role of an Afghan leader during the power struggle that existed after the collapse of the Durrani Empire in the 1800s. Your goal is to emerge as the dominant leader out of all of the other Afghan leaders playing the game. To do this, you'll need to make decisions about what coalition you'll be loyal to, Afghan, Russian, or British, and then work on either strengthening and gaining influence with that coalition, or if there isn't a dominant coalition, then you'll need to change your strategy and play the game of espionage and attaining regional power. Loyalty, however, isn't permanent no. in Pax Pamir, and in order to stay competitive, you may have to ebb and flow with the current political climate and change coalitions and possibly change strategies. For our setup, I'm going to use the cloth map and use the market on the board included in Pax Pamir. Alternatively, you can use just the opposite side of this market board for your game map and then use no board for your market. Roll out the map or use the map board, find the favored suit marker, and place this marker on the purple political suit to start the game. Place a ruler token on each region of the map. Match the shape from the center of the token with the shape as seen on the region of the map. You can place the market board to the right, the left of the map, or place it above the map. Sort out and shuffle all these blue back cards with this exquisitely intricate design into three piles. One pile with court cards, one pile with event cards, and then one small pile with the four dominance check cards. Take your shuffled pile of court cards and divide them into six piles. You place five cards plus one card for each player in each pile. So since we're playing with three players, we'll place eight cards into each stack or pile. And then you can place the rest of these cards back in the box. Place one dominance card in these four rightmost piles. Then take your shuffled pile of event cards and place two in the second pile from the left, and then one in each of the piles to the right of this one. Then place the rest of these event cards back in the box. Shuffle each pile, and then stack these up, keeping the right deck on the very bottom. Keep taking decks from right to left, stacking them on top of the previous deck. This makes up your draw deck. Fill the market with cards from the top of the draw deck. Fill each column from left to right. Fill the top space first, and then the bottom. Like this. So next we'll create our player area. Each player takes a player board and the 11 cylinders matching the player color. Find the one cylinder with this exquisite pattern on one side and place this in the upper left corner of the map board. This will be used as your victory point marker for the game. Each player takes their loyalty dial and four rupees and then choose a random player. That player selects a coalition that they're loyal to at the start of the game. Afghan, Russian, or British. Then, players continue to choose loyalty going clockwise around the table. Whoever the last player to choose their loyalty gets to take the first turn of the game. Before we get into how to take your turn, I think it helps to understand how you earn victory points in this game and how the dominance checks work. 
At up to four times during the game, when a Dominance check card is either purchased or discarded from the market, Dominance will be assessed and victory points awarded. So when Dominance is checked, if there is a strong coalition that has four or more blocks on the board than any other coalitions, the Dominance check is considered successful. By the way, blocks are either armies if they're standing up or roads if they're laying down. Points are awarded to the top three most influential players loyal to that coalition. Players get one influence for each loyalty icon they have in their player area. These come from patriots, prizes, and gifts on their loyalty dial, and one point even for the icon on the loyalty dial itself. The player with the most influence is awarded five points, then three points for second place, and one point for third place. There are no points awarded beyond third place, and if you were not part of that coalition, you score nothing. So definitely watch the coalition you're loyal to. If it's getting left behind, you may consider changing your coalition, but this will sometimes come at a price. Now what happens during one of these dominance checks if there's no dominant coalition? If this happens, the dominance check is considered unsuccessful or a failure. Points are awarded to the player who has the most regional power, and the top two players with the most cylinders in play will score points. Three points are awarded for the player with the most cylinders in play, and one point awarded for the player in second place. No points are awarded beyond that. The number of cylinders missing from each player's player board is a quick way to assess who is in the lead if the dominance check is unsuccessful. Now, there could be an early end of the game if after any dominance check, the lead player is four or more victory points ahead of the second place player. The game is over and the lead player wins in that situation. If you do make it to the fourth and final dominance check, then the points of this check are doubled. The game ends and the player with the most victory points is the winner. On your turn, you always get to take two actions. And if you're lucky enough to have bonus actions, you can take those as well. With your two actions, you can always choose from the core actions, purchase and play. Purchase lets you purchase a card from the market. If you purchase an event card or dominance check card, these get resolved right away. And if you purchase a court card, this gets added to your hand. The other core action is the play action. Play lets you play a card from your hand to your court. And think of the court as a tableau. Once you have cards in your court, you will also be able to choose to take the actions as seen on your cards. When you play some cards, they can change the favored suit marker. And this favored suit marker can be thought of as an indicator of the current climate of Afghanistan. If this marker is on the same suit as a card or cards you have in your court, you can take one bonus action from each of those cards as a free action on your turn if you wish. You can do as little or as much as you have available on your turn, and you can do this in any order. For example, to maximize a turn, you can buy a card from the market as one of your actions. You can take a bonus action from one of the cards in your court that matches the favored suit, and then for your second action, you can play a card which changes the suit again, and then play a bonus action from another card in your court that matches that new favored suit. After you take your actions, you go through your cleanup phase where you discard cards from your court down to your court size, discard cards from your hand down to your hand size, discard and resolve any event cards from the zero space of the market, and then refill the market. The game ends when either the fourth and final dominance check card is purchased or discarded, and the player with the most victory points wins. Or the game ends abruptly after any dominance check if the lead player is four or more points ahead of the second place player. Now that you know that, we're ready to dive in with much greater detail so you can be ready to play this one on game night. Let's start by looking at the two core actions of Purchase and Play, and then we'll cover all the card-based actions. When you purchase a card from the market, you pay rupees for the card equal to the column where the card is located. 
the rupees you pay for the card don't go back to the supply, but get added one at a time to the cards to the left of the card you purchased this turn. This keeps the rupees that are in play always circulating between players. There is one exception to the prices as shown on the cards in the market. If the favored suit marker is currently in the military suit or this red space, all the prices of the market are doubled. The prices are doubled for all cards, not just military suit cards. Okay, if I were to purchase the Opium Fields card in the three column, I would put one rupee on each card to the left of this one in the same row. One, two, three. If by chance you already purchased another card from the same row, creating a blank space, then you would just place the rupee to the card in the opposite row and then continue placing rupees in the same row as the card you purchased. Any card you place a rupee on this turn are off limits for purchase for the rest of your turn. So think your turn through carefully before you buy. So now that we're clear on how you pay for a card in the market, let's talk about what happens when you purchase an event card, and then we'll talk about what happens when you purchase a court card. For event cards, you resolve the when purchased instructions immediately and discard it. If the card has an effect that lingers for a period of time, like until the next dominance check or something like that, put this card under your court as a reminder and then discard it when it's no longer relevant. By the way, when you purchase an event card, the card's effect only targets you unless it says that it alters the game state, and in that circumstance, it would target everyone. Now let's look at what happens if you purchase a court card. When you purchase a court card, this gets added to your hand, not your court. When you start the game, you have a hand limit of two. That means at the end of your turn, if you're holding any more than two cards, you'll have to discard down to your hand limit. Later in the game, when you start playing court cards, for each blue star shown on cards in your court, your hand size increases by one. By the way, there is no rule stating that you can't play your games with your hands open where everyone can see them. Some groups choose to play with their hands private, where you'll have to put your memory to the test and recall what each player has purchased, while other gaming groups play with cards open. I'd be interested in how your gaming group does this in the comments. Another core action that you always have available to take on your turn is the play action. The play action lets you take a card from your hand and add it to your court. After you add it to your court, then you resolve the impact icons as shown on the upper right side of the card. When you start the game, you have a maximum court size of 3 that you have to discard down to at the end of your turn, but for each purple star shown on the cards in your court, you increase your court size by 1. This doesn't mean you can't have more than three cards in your court during your turn, though. It just means you have to discard down to three at the end of your turn. Now you ask, hey Pete, why would I want to do this? Well, sometimes you may want to just play cards to activate its impact icons, as you'll be able to see what these do in just a bit. When you take a play action and add a card to your court, you either add it to the left or right of any existing cards, and then resolve all the impact icons as seen in the upper right side of the court card. By the way, once you add a card to your court, you can't rearrange any of them, and you'll see why in just a little bit. For now, just remember there is a reason you can't rearrange the order of your court. There are some circumstances you have to be aware of when playing your card to your court. If you play a card where another player rules the same region as the card you want to play, you must pay that player a bribe in rupees equal to the number of tribes they have in the region. Or that player could also choose to just waive the bribe. We'll cover what it takes to rule a region later in the video. Just for now, know that if a player has the ruling token, they rule the region. 
If the region is not ruled by another player, you can freely play the card and just add it to your court. One last circumstance to be aware of is that if you add a Patriot card that is of a different coalition than the one that you're currently loyal to, so let's say I'm loyal to the Afghan coalition and I want to play a British Patriot, you'll have to change your loyalty. To change your loyalty, you'll have to return gift cylinders back to your supply and then discard any Patriots and prizes from your previous loyalty. Anytime you change loyalty in this game, this is what you have to do. After you add a card to your court, you'll resolve all of the non-optional impact icons as seen in the upper right side of the card from top to bottom. Again, all of these impact icons are non-optional. If you run into a circumstance where you run out of coalition blocks from your supply or cylinders on your player board, you must take another one already in play and repurpose it to resolve the impact icon. This is the Add Army icon. To resolve any of these impact icons, add one coalition block of the same color as seen on your loyalty dial to the region as listed on the card you played. Just like the impact icon shows, the army block is placed upright to represent that it is an army. If the Add Army icon has color, that means you're playing a Patriot card. And remember, if you play a Patriot, you have to either be loyal to the same coalition as a Patriot, or change your loyalty to match the Patriot's coalition, as mentioned earlier. Similar to the Add Army icon, for the Add Road icon, you place one coalition block matching your loyalty, laying down on any border of the region as noted on the card. This will now create a road between the two regions, and you'll see later that roads are needed to move your armies around. By the way, you can have multiple roads of the same color on the same border, and or you can have roads of the same color next to roads of a different coalition color. For the Add Spy Impact icon, you take one of your cylinders from the lowest number on your player board and place it as a spy on any card marked with the same region as is marked on the card you just played. This spy could be placed on a card in your court or a card in another player's court. You can even play this on the spy card you just played, and sometimes this is your only option as there are no other cards out there that match this region. Spies are ultimately good for you. As we'll see in just a bit, spies can hold cards hostage, they can be used to betray the card they're placed on, they can battle with other spies on the card, and they get more cylinders out on the table for you in the case of an unsuccessful dominance check. We'll keep talking about spies as we go. So the tribe icon acts similar to the spy icon, but instead of placing a cylinder on a card matching the region, you place your cylinder directly on the region as noted on the card. Tribes are considered ruling pieces in Pax Pamir, and when you place one, you'll check to see if you rule the region, which I'll get into more detail next. So one thing to note is the tribe impact icon is only found on your purple political suit cards. Your tribes and your purple political suit cards are tied together, where if you lose your last tribe in a region, you also lose your purple political suit cards for that specific region. And if you were to lose your last purple political suit card for a region, you also lose your tribes in that same region. This is referred to in the game as the overthrow rule. Oh no. Alright, so just a slight diversion from the impact icons, but something you need to know now is back to ruling a region. Ruling a region gives you advantages where you'll be able to take advantage of some card-based actions, and of course you'll be able to collect bribes from other players who want to play a card matching the region you rule. So in order to rule a region, you must have a tribe in the region, and also have more ruling pieces than other players. 
Ruling pieces just means armies loyal to you and your tribes. Once you have the most pieces in a region, you are the ruler and collect the ruling token. If you are competing with a player from the same coalition as you, then you add your tribes and armies just the same, but this really just comes down to a contest of who has the most tribes in the region since your armies are shared. Anytime you're tied with another player for the most ruling pieces, or another player has more ruling pieces than you, you return the ruling token to the region or the player who now rules the region. Alright, so back to the rest of the impact icons. When you resolve the leverage icon, you take two rupees from the supply. As soon as this card is discarded, you must repay those same two rupees back to the supply. If you have no rupees to repay, then for each rupee you can't repay, you must discard a card from either your hand or your court. And if you don't have any cards left at all, then you don't have to do anything else. If you see one of these four impact icons on the card you're playing, you change the favored suit by moving the favored suit marker to the new favored suit. The favored suits are political, intelligence, economic, and military. The current favored suit can be thought of as the current climate of the situation in Afghanistan, and it is very powerful as you can take one free action called a bonus action from each of the cards in your court matching that favored suit. Also, if you change the favored suit to military, then along with being able to take one free action on all of your military cards in your court, the cost of all cards in the market is doubled. Just remember that. Yikes. And you have a nice reminder of that next to the military suit marker on the map. Let's look at a couple examples of the play action. I want to play Opium Field from my hand to my court. Since no one rules Herat, I can play this to my court without paying a bribe. So the impact icons on this card show that I add two roads to Herat. And I'll just add one between the border of Herat and Persia, and one between the border of Herat and Kandahar. I can then place one of my spies on any Herat card. So I place this on Opium Fields, since there are no other Herat cards in play by me or any other players. Finally, I move the favored suit marker over to military. For another example on a different turn, where I take the play action, I want to play Muhammad Shah from my hand to my court, and I see that the red player rules Persia and has one tribe on this region. So in order to play this card, I must either pay the red player one rupee as a bribe, or see if he'll waive the bribe so I can play it for free. The red player decides not to waive the bribe, so I pay him one rupee. When I do, I add the card to my court and resolve the impact icons. The first is the tribe icon, so I play a cylinder from the lowest numbered space on my player board as a tribe on the region. Since the red player and I are now tied for the most ruling pieces in this region, the red player no longer rules this area and returns the ruling token back to Persia. For the next impact icon, I place one coalition army matching my loyalty, which is British, into Persia. This now gives me the most ruling pieces in Persia, so I take the ruling token and then, for the final impact icon, I move the favored suit marker to the intelligence suit. Card-based actions from the cards in your court cost you one action to use, but cost you no action if the suit of the card matches the favored suit. No matter how many actions are shown on a card, you can only use one action per card per turn. So if I use the gift action from my Seek Merchants in Lahore on a turn, I cannot use the tax action during that same turn. 
You'll see as we look at card-based actions that the cards rank, meaning the number of stars listed on the card, allow you to do more of the action on a turn. Cards in Pax Pamir either have one, two, or three stars. A card with one star lets you do one of the action on some actions. A card with a rank two lets you do two of the actions, and so on. The action icon reminds you of this as well by repeating the icon for the action equal to the card's rank. You'll see rank impacts some actions like the tax, move, and battle actions, and no effect on build, gift, and betray actions. One more thing with card-based actions is if the action requires you to pay rupees to perform it, your rupees get added to the market rather than going back to the supply. When you pay for an action, your rupees get added to the cards in the top and bottom of the rightmost column first, working your way inward. For example, if my action costs 4 rupees to play, I place them like this. Also, even if the action is considered a bonus action because the favored suit marker matches the suit of your card, you still have to pay the cost in rupees to perform the action. Alright, so let's get on with card-based actions. The gift action lets you place one of your cylinders on one of the three gift spaces on your loyalty dial. To do this, you pay rupees to the market equal to the cost shown on the gift space. Then, take the leftmost cylinder from your player board and add it to your loyalty dial. The gift spaces cost 2, 4, or 6 rupees, depending on which space you choose. Gifts are great to have during any dominance check. They add one influence each to your total when the dominance check is successful, meaning when there is a dominant coalition, or each gift is counted as a cylinder in play if the dominance check is a failure, meaning that there is no dominant coalition. The tax action always allows you to take rupees from any card in the market. You can do more with this action, however, if you rule a region. So if you rule a region on the map, you can take rupees from another player who has a card in their court matching the region you rule. The amount of rupees you can collect, either from the market and or another player, depends on the rank of the card. Again, this is represented by the action icon on the card. If this icon shows 1 rupee, you can collect 1. If this icon shows 2, you can collect 2, and so on. So, for example, I rule Punjab and take a tax action from the Karakul Sheep rank 2 court card. I take 1 rupee from the red player since he has a Punjab card, and then I take the other rupee from the market. I would have also been able to take 2 rupees from the red player if he would have had more and if I wanted to. Now, if I used the tax action from Karakul Sheep and didn't rule region, then I would just be limited to taking 2 rupees from any market spaces. Now you'll notice that the region listed on the card I use the tax action from doesn't have to match the region I rule. Just the player I tax has to have a card in that region I rule. Now I'm going to introduce something new, as a player could have a tax shelter on some of their rupees. For each gold star shown in the cards in their court, one of their rupees is protected from tax. Any rupees above and beyond the amount of gold stars a player has are taxable. So if I use the tax action from Karakul Sheep to tax the red player who has a card in his court from Punjab, he has 4 rupees, but only 2 gold stars shown on his court cards. I could collect the 2 rupees from the red player. If that player had 3 stars in his court, then I could only collect 1 rupee from the red player, and I would have to collect the other rupee from the market. The build action allows you to build either 1, 2, or 3 roads and or armies in any region you rule. For 2 rupees, you can add 1 road or army. For 4 rupees, you can add 2 roads and or armies. And for 6 rupees, you can add 3 roads and or armies. Again, you can only build in a region you rule, and of course the blocks you add have to match your loyalty. By the way, the court card with the build action doesn't have to match the region you rule. For example, I can use the build action from a Persia court card 
to add a road and an army to Punjab since I'm the ruler of that region. The move action allows you to move either one spy or one loyal army one space per rank of the card. If you have a rank 1 move action, you can just move a spy or an army one space. If you have a rank 2 move action, you can move two spaces and so on. To move a spy, you can move your spy either clockwise or counterclockwise around the court cards on the table. One space for a spy is moving the spy from one court card to an adjacent court card, or the next court card. Card order is important because of this, and now you see the reason you can't rearrange your court cards. Okay, so one space for an army is moving from one region to another adjacent region. In order to move an army, you must also have a road matching the same loyalty as the army. For the move action, I could just move one army as many spaces as the rank of the card with the action. Or I could split the move between different armies or spies. For example, I use a rank 3 move action, I can move a spy one space and then move one of my armies two spaces. To take a betray action, you pay two rupees to the market, and you can then discard one card that you have one of your spies on. This card could be in your court or the court of another player. The assassin lurks. <gasps> when you discard a card, the spy that was on the card gets returned to your supply. After you discard the betrayed card, you have the option to take the card as a prize. The prize icon only exists on some cards, but when a card is taken as a prize, it is tucked under your loyalty dial and each prize counts as one influence toward a successful dominance check. If the prize is different than your current loyalty, and you decide to take it, you'll need to change your loyalty. Remember, to do this you discard any gifts, Patriots and prizes from your previous loyalty, and then change your loyalty dial to match that of your new prize. One more thing about the betray action. If you betray a purple political suit card, and this is the last political card for that region in your court or another player's court, then you or that player must discard all tribes in the region, matching the political card as well. Remember, Purple political cards and the tribes matching the region of the political card are tied together with the overthrow rule. Okay, the last card action that we have to cover is the battle action. Sometimes when nothing else is working, you just have to fight. When you take this action, you can battle in a single region or on a single court card. Yes, not only can you battle on the map, you can battle between spies on a court card. When you want to battle in a region on the map, you first select the region you want to battle in. You remove armies, roads, and tribes equal to the rank of the action. But to do this, you also have to have at least as many armies in the region as the pieces you remove. Two restrictions to this action that make sense. When you battle, you can't remove armies or roads from the same coalition you're loyal to, and you can't remove tribes of other players loyal to your same coalition. Players in the same coalition don't fight, unless it's by your spies. When you battle between spies on a court card, you remove spies up to the rank of the action, and you have to also have at least as many spies as the opponent's spies you remove. A difference when you battle between spies is that you can battle another player's spies who are loyal to the same coalition as you. When it comes to espionage, anything is fair game. Ooh. So for example, on one turn I use an action to take the rank 2 battle action from my Russian regulars and battle in Transcaspia. I remove an army and road from the British here, and I can do this because I have as many armies as the pieces I can remove. So for another example, I again use one of my actions on my turn to take the rank 2 battle action from my Russian regulars. I choose to battle in Punjab, and I remove a tribe from the red player and one Afghan army. I can remove both because I have two Russian armies in the same region. I couldn't have removed the tribe from the blue player because they're loyal to the same coalition as me. 
Now because I removed the last tribe from the red player, they also discard their last purple political card from that region. And since they no longer have the most ruling pieces in the region, they pass the ruling token over to the blue player. So that's it for actions you can take on your turn. So just to recap, you get two actions per turn, plus any bonus free actions from cards that match the favored suit icon. During your turn, you can always take the core actions of purchase and play, or you can also use your actions to use actions from cards in your court. Remember, you can only use one action per card per turn. So for an example of a turn, I play Bulk Arsenic Mine to my court and resolve its impact icons and add a road in Cobble and then change the favored suit marker to Military. I use the build action from Citadel of Ghazni as a free bonus action since its suit is Military and the favored marker is on Military. I spend 4 rupees to use the build action and decide to add 2 armies in Herat. I rule Herat by the way and that's why I can do this. I am loyal to the Afghan coalition, so these blocks are green. Then I use my last action and use the tax action from Lapis Lazuli Mine to collect 2 rupees. I rule Herat, and the gray player has a card from Herat, but doesn't have any rupees, so I take 2 rupees from the market and go on to the cleanup phase of my turn, which we'll cover almost next. But there's a couple other things we need to know first. Alright, so what all can spies do again? When your spy is on a card, you can use the betray action to discard the card and take it as a prize if it has one. The spies on a card count as cylinders in play during a dominance check that is considered unsuccessful. But one other thing spies can do is hold a card hostage. A card is held hostage when one other player has the majority of spies on a card. When a card is held hostage, if you want to use any actions on the card, you'll need to pay the player holding the card hostage with the majority of spies one rupee for each of their spies on the card. So if I wanted to use the tax action on Lapis Lazuli Mines in this example, I would need to pay the gray player two rupees. Now if two players are tied for majority of spies on a card, then the card is not held hostage. If you discard a card from your court with spies on it at the end of your turn because your court size is too big, the spies go back to the matching player board. If you remember, you can also get rid of spies using the battle action, but you'll need to have spies equal to the number you're removing as well. Now some of the cards in your court have special abilities as noted by these text boxes. We haven't talked too much about special abilities at this point, but special abilities always take precedent over the rules and are always in effect when they're in your court. Also, special abilities can't be held hostage with your opponent's spies like your card's actions can. So after you're done taking actions, you move on to the cleanup part of your turn. There are four steps to cleanup. During cleanup, you discard down to your hand size. Remember, hand size is 2 plus any blue stars in your court. You discard down to your court size. Your court size is 3 plus any purple stars in your court. And yes, it's okay to discard cards with other player spies on them. One note on discarding, however. You can't arbitrarily discard more cards from your hand or court than your current size limit. Discard and resolve any event cards in the zero column of the market. Just event cards get discarded from the market, not court cards. When you do this, you leave the rupees in the space as they get added to the card that slides over into this space. Huh? Next, clean up the market by shifting cards to the left to fill any vacant spaces. Fill any empty slot in columns from leftmost to rightmost. If or when both cards in a column are missing, fill the top first and then the bottom. This helps ensure that event cards and dominance check cards appear when they're supposed to. So at the end of my turn, I have just two cards in my hand, so I don't have to discard any cards. I have five cards in my court, 
but only have one purple star shown, so I have to discard down to my court limit. I decide to discard one card with a spy on it, and now that spy is returned back to its owner's supply. I discard the public market event card from the zero space in the market, and this card says, until discarded, this card cannot be purchased. Any money placed on this card in the market is instead removed from the game. So I return the two rupees on this card to the supply. I slide cards from the right to the left to fill gaps in the market, and then draw two cards from the draw pile, and fill the five column top first, then bottom. We covered the basics of dominance checks early on, but let's cover this in a bit more detail here. As a reminder, when either someone purchases a dominance check card from the market, or the dominance check card gets discarded from the market, you immediately perform a dominance check. You first determine if the dominance check is successful or not by seeing if there is a coalition that has four or more blocks on the map than any other coalition. If the dominance check is considered successful, points are awarded to the top three most influential players loyal to that coalition. Players get one influence for each loyalty icon they have in their player area. These come from patriots, prizes, gifts on their loyalty dial, and then don't forget that you get one point for the icon on the loyalty dial itself. The player with the most influence is awarded five points, then three points for second place, and one point for third place. You award victory points and then remove all blocks from all coalitions, both armies and roads, from the board. However, tribes remain on the board. If there is no dominant coalition, then the dominance check is considered unsuccessful. Points are awarded to the player who has the most regional power, and the top two players with the most cylinders in play will score points. Three points awarded for the player with the most cylinders in play, and one point awarded for the player in second place. No points are awarded beyond that. And remember, for the fourth and final dominance check, players are awarded double points. Now if you run into a situation where more than one player is tied during a dominance check, you add the points together for the two places the players would get after the dominance check, divide this number by two, and round down. For example, let's say the red player and the yellow player are tied for first place during a successful dominance check. You take the 5 points awarded for first place and the 3 points awarded for second place and add these together to get 8 victory points. Then divide this number by 2 so each player gets 4 points. Now one more note about dominance checks. If two dominance check cards are in the market at the same time, then you immediately perform a dominance check and both cards get discarded and the empty spaces then get filled. If one of the cards discarded was the fourth dominance check card, then points awarded would be doubled. After the final dominance check, if players are tied for victory points, then whichever player has the most red stars from the cards in their court wins. So if you're wondering about red stars throughout this whole video, the only thing they do for you is break a victory point tie. Alright, so here's my top 5 tips that I either didn't realize or mistakes I've made during my games. Number 1. You can't just arbitrarily change loyalty in the game. To change loyalty, you'll have to either add a Patriot from a different coalition to your court, or take a Betrayed card as a prize from a different coalition. When you change loyalty, you immediately discard any Patriots, prizes from your previous loyalty to the discard pile, then return any gifts from your loyalty dial back to the supply. Number two, if players abandon a coalition, meaning no player is any longer loyal to a coalition, the blocks for that abandoned coalition remain on the map. These wouldn't get discarded until after a successful dominance check. Number three, if you remember from the battle action, you can't remove tribes from a player who's loyal to the same coalition as you. However, there is a way in the game to remove these tribes from the map. 
Since political suit cards are tied to tribes, if you have a spy on another player's last purple political suit card in a region, and use the betray action to discard that card, you'll also remove your loyal opponent's tribes from the region on the map of the same region as the political card you just discarded. This is based on the overthrow rule of the game. Always check to see if this takes effect not only when a purple card is discarded, but when a player's last tribe is removed from a region, as their purple political cards in that region would also be discarded. Number 4. Dominance Checks After a successful dominance check, all blocks are removed from the map, not just those from the successful coalition. Number 5. If you play a card of a region that's ruled by another player and you don't have enough rupees to pay the bribe and or the other player doesn't waive the bribe, you won't get to play the card. But just treat this action like it didn't happen and choose a different action to play. To continue your PAX Pamir learning journey, I'll post the playlist link here for the other videos in this series and also post this link in the description. If you're watching this soon after release, the other videos are soon to come. Also, if you're into other PAX games, you can check out my PAX Perfuriana series, which is another game I'm passionate about, and I made these videos a few years ago, so I look a little younger. The link's in the description, and always, you can support all things Modern Cardboard and help the channel by becoming a patron over at Patreon, and by subscribing here. I definitely appreciate it, and have a great one.